allow me to go through two seasons of Beast Wars, two seasons of Beast Machines, and then they brought me back to find the Unicron trilogy. We are slightly annoyed they didn't use you for a role in Skies, and they gave it to Neil Kaplan instead. I uh, didn't use me for a role in Robots in Disguise? No, because I was uh, quite busy doing a television series called Cold Squad and Stargate, so I didn't really have any time. And I never even knew that they were doing Robots in Disguise, because they were doing it in the States. But uh, Neil was very funny, Neil Kaplan, who played uh, my role in that, uh, in that series, was annoyed that he wasn't doing all the rest. And, uh, so he was, uh, he was, apparently he was dissing me a bit. And then, a few months ago, I actually met him face to face at a, a sci-fi convention in Calgary and I thought, oh, I don't know, if I meet him, am I gonna punch him? Am I gonna beat him up? And, uh, and then I met him and he was a really nice guy, so we had a great time. You know, we, we converse back and forth on Facebook all the time. Uh, now, we have one right here. Speak up, Lala. Out of all the roles you've performed, which one do you say was the most challenging? Of all the roles that I performed, the most challenging role I've ever had to perform? Oh! <laughs> What's the most challenging role I've ever had to perform? Oh! I'll tell you, the most challenging role, the most difficult role I ever had, was a character called Metalhead in G.I. Joe. Because he was just off the map, so, bang, yeah, let's go, oh, rip it up, oh, oh. And then, you do that for six hours a day, and you get a little sore. But, uh, he was also the most fun, because he, he would go from being a, like, a little tiny kid, oh, mommy, help me, to, oh, can I blow it up, Cobra Commander? Come on, let me, please, please, I can't stand it when I can't blow things up. And it would just go like that, for, you know, and go back and forth and back and forth drive you out of your mind. So that was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. The Fly 2, the movie called The Fly 2, I played the, the part of Scorby in that, and that was a, a very difficult role because phys it was very physically demanding. In that you had to hang upside down for hours and get thrown through windows and God knows what all. It was a little tough. But uh, all the rest, I mean, everyone has their own challenges, but I, I think that was... Those two really stick out in my head. Yes. Who? Which? What do you what? think of your Japanese uh, voice actors or voicing the your character, Optimus Prime? Oh. Gozo, come on, I get this. Yeah, I I get a real kick out of it because I hit it. So I I I love the voices that they have in Japan. They have some real good ones. I uh, just finished a, a show called uh, Eon Kid, or Iron Kid, and it was uh, a Japanese, and my character is a, uh, a junkyard, I, I'm the narrator of the show, and also a junkyard owner, a crook, and uh, the guy had, sounds like me. It just sounds like me. And uh, I love the acting. The only thing I can't, I can't get my head around as far as prelay goes is um, in Japanese it's very polysyllabic. Lots of this. So you're gonna go, yes, I like strawberry jam. Sometimes I like raspberry jam, but strawberry jam is very good. It's very hard to follow to match in English. Word fit, that's what I'm talking about, word fit. And it would always go, da -da -da, ba -da -da -da, ba -da -da, ba -da -da. because of the the Japanese uh, rhythms, the way they speak. I uh, I uh, had a, a difficult time, but I still love the, the characters, the way they work. Yes, Brady. Hi, I was, I was wondering, um, has there been any news about um, the revival of Has there any been has there, has there any been news, has there been any news about the revival of Reboot? Uh, so no, no, I, slash I just don't know. I have, uh, I have talked to Kevin about Reboot being revived, but the problem is there are three different companies who control the product. 
And until they all come together and say, yes, we want this project to be revived, uh, we're sort of stuck in limbo. That's why you've never seen a uh, DVD box set released for a reboot is because of the legal ramifications, because there's three owners of the company who can't come to grips with who gets what, where, and when. So Gavin who and uh, Ian, who created the, uh, the, the show, the writers, all of the original cast, all of us are there. We're sitting here, the scripts are written, everything's done. We're ready to do the show. We've been warned of it numerous times. But so far, no one has given us a, for, a, a firm record date. So that's all I can tell you. It's in the works. We just don't know when it's going to be recorded. Yes. We got one here and one here. Where's that microphone fella? One here, one here. Where's this one? This one, this one. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Do you have any advice for people who are getting into voice acting? Uh, advice for voice actors. Oh my God, that's an hour. No, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be giving you any pithy, quick advice. I can be real funny and say, yeah, just go and get a tape recorder and make funny voices, but it's more than that. Um, really, uh, honestly, if you want to pursue a career as a voice actor, pursue the acting part of it rather than the voice. Because we all have voices. Every one of us has a voice. But we got to, uh, you have to work on the acting chops. And the acting chops is that anybody can do a funny voice. Well, anybody can do a funny voice, that's your problem. Yeah, but can you do Shakespeare and make it believable in that funny voice? You know. It's like with, uh, with someone like Grounder. So who's taking us beyond? So one with care. Find me a fairy piece to pan to breathe new bras and strands of far remote. You know, you know what I'm saying. So you've got to get, uh, you've got to get your, your chops together. Because if you actually look, thank you so much. But if you actually look, this is an exercise I, I do that everybody, every one of us has 12 voices. It's all about where you place your voice. You can put your voice at the top of your head. Gives you a nice light voice, take it through your eyes, you never change the tone of your voice, you just keep it the same, put it into your nose, and all of a sudden it's nasal. Take that voice and, and take it from your nose into the front of your mouth, and you get a sort of a strange, tight, uh, uptight kind of an individual. Put it into the middle of your mouth, and it gets even a little tiny bit of touch. Take it to the back of your throat, down into your chest, and into your chest, and get it nice and big and warm. Add a little gravel to it. Take it up here into your throat. Get it a little bit higher in your throat, in the middle of your mouth, to the front of your teeth, into your nose, and then your eyes in the top of your head. <laughs> Stick your jaw out, make some kind of a, an impediment of, of some sort, or, or, or go off rhythm, and, and, uh, 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 or, 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 or stutter, or, or speak really fast, and then really slow. It's all about rhythm and placement. So as long as you can get the rhythm and placement of all these voices, now what you have to do is make a character, create a character out of those, those placements. And you create the character by having a really solid understanding of what the script is, what the script is saying, and what you're doing in the script. Do you understand? And then once you've got the acting chops down, you throw the voice in there, and what do you do? You look at a cartoon character, or any cartoon character, and you look at the physicality of that character. You know, is he tall and thin and weak? Or is he big and wide and fat? There's, you know, they, they all have to adhere to certain physical laws, right? And, uh, and it's very important that when you're looking at these, char these characters, that you find how they laugh. Once you find how they laugh, you can usually find the character. I'm keeping somebody up. But uh, there you go. Yeah, next question. Yeah. How did you get into voice acting? How did I get into voice acting? I get kicked out of class. <laughs> we, used to, we used to do funny things when I was in high school. I used to, they have a tannoy, you know, the high school tannoy. And the principal headmaster would come up and make announcements. And uh, some of us who were voice guys used to sneak into the principal's office and get on the tannoy and say, Now, uh, go. Now everybody, it's time 
for lunch and we're going 15 minutes early today because oh I can't remember what it was but anyway everybody left school 15 minutes before lunch early and created chaos in the school and uh, we got caught mimicking the the, uh, the the headmaster's voice and got kicked out <laughs> only for two days but we still got kicked out and I thought well we can have something here and where I got started in cartoons my very first cartoon that I ever did was a thing called uh, Hiawatha and it was for Kenner Classics and I, I think if you look on eBay you can actually find it and I played about five characters on the show and um, I had auditioned for it in Ottawa and uh, it did it and people liked it and then uh, after that it just sort of grew into other things, the Care Bears and uh, and uh, G.I. Joe and Knights of Justice and Kissy Fur and Camp Candy. Just That's basically how I got into it. I've always been a voice guy uh, as far as acting in school went. I always excelled in that area because I just love the sound of my own voice. I don't know. <laughs> so that's how I got started. Yes. Of all the episodes in Beast Wars, what was your favorite? <laughs> uh, battle for what? Where where uh, Primal becomes a real a real ape? Uh, battle for come on, you guys, you know every episode. Battle for what? The, well, that's the episode. Is where where Primal goes. Primal something to do with the side effect of the uh, of the. Uh, Somebody came up with it. That was the one I really liked. And that was a very challenging one to do as well. Yes. Okay. Oh. Have you, all your memories are worth the Nick Fury Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. <laughs> Nick Fury Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Well, David Hasselhoff, I gotta tell you, is a character. Kind of professional on stage, wonderful guy. Him and I used to go out drinking uh, every night, but I'm not a drinker, so. Uh, but he was just sort of drying out, so he wasn't drinking very much either. But we hung out for like a week or two because he wanted to get that feeling, you know, that we were buddies, and so he's very method. So we just hung out, and of course, we got swamped everywhere we went, uh, going to bars and stuff. So people would come and take a picture with him, and he would say, okay. I'll take a picture with you, but you can't touch me, and you can't sit on me. You can stay right here, that far away, and then we'll take the photo. It'll look like you're sitting on me, but you're not. And so, I went, that is so weird. And, he said, and I said, how did you, what, what is the deal with that? And he says, 14 lawsuits. 14 lawsuits. But Nick Fury itself was really fun, because it was a mixture of CGI and, uh, uh, CGI and real life, and uh, one of our guy, one of your guys here, Neil, uh, Neil, come on, what's his name? The English actor who does the, uh, the pantos, and he was also in Nick Fury as the young English officer, he lives here in London, he's an uh, actor, Neil, Neil Roberts. Neil Roberts, you guys don't know Neil Roberts, do you? No. Well, Neil Roberts would do, does all the audio books for uh, Stargate. And he was also in Nick Fury. He was the young British keener officer in that in that movie, and uh, he was a delight to work with. Uh, most of them were were really fun. I just had a a great time with it. And Rod Hardy, the guy who directed it, was a, an Australian. And uh, since uh, since Nick Fury, I've, I've hung out with Rod Rock Hardy for the probably the last ten years. But there were some there were some crisis moments. We had a, a time where we had this, this huge scene in the control room where they're trying to stop uh, the bad guys from doing something. I said, yes, we stopped them, we stopped them. But we, we, they were trying to destroy the city with some kind of toxic, I don't know, disease. And uh, one of the actresses, <laughs> she had a line at the end of the scene. And, and we'd be working there, working, rushing all the things going, the lights flashing. And, 
get to her line and she go, and she flub it.